welcome everyone to our uh, Urban Vanguard with the Historic House Trust, Trust and um, I'm sorry, you're just, you're just so fanny. <laughs> I have the wind, we were laughing about this earlier, but I have the windows open, so it looks like there's like a wind machine coming, but it's how I'm keeping cool, all right? <laughs> but yeah. And uh, Jessica Baldwin Phillips from um, Historic Richmond Town. This is for any of you who are unaware, the Urban Vanguard is our, uh, call it youth, uh, younger people. Oh, we, we lost Jessica. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she has cats and children, so there's a good chance she'll just like leave in the middle of it anyway. That's not happening. <laughs> uh, yes, but all are welcome to participate in Urban Vanguard, always. Uh, so this will be a sort of multi-part virtual tour of a few of the houses on site. We are going to sort of switch back and forth between Matthew uh, questioning and like having a discussion with Jessica and showing a few videos. And afterwards we will do a Q&A. So if you have any questions, just put them in the chat or the Q&A section below. And then we will get to those. And so with that, I will hand it over to Matthew. Hello, everybody. Um, so welcome to sunny and windy Greenpoint, <laughs> Brooklyn, um, which is actually Greenpoint is why or how I first got involved with the Historic Districts Council. Um, kind of when I back years ago when I started an organization to help preserve the neighborhood. So, um, you know, I'm on the currently on the board of the Historic District Council. Um, and I also serve as the Director of External Affairs for the Historic House Trust. Um, so if you don't know the Historic House Trust, I bet a lot of you do just kind of part of the preservation world. But um, so we're a public-private partnership with the New York City Parks Department. Um, a major component of our mission is assisting in the preservation of 23 historic sites across all five boroughs of New York City, um, all of which are on park land. Um, one of these, of course, is Historic Richmond Town, um, our featured site tonight. And it's actually kind of the perfect match for the Historic Districts Council because it's kind of our most like historic districty like site um, that we work with. You know, it's really, and it's interesting, they, so their flagship site is about 100 acres with 30 historic structures on it. And Jessica, jump in if I'm like misnumbering anything um, out there, but this grouping of 30 structures includes like a courthouse and a tavern and a print shop and a mill and even a couple like privies, which I love. Um, I think you have two, two of those, right, Jessica? I think um, we have four. Four, amazing. <laughs> you know, people need to have somewhere to go. So, um, but that's also not really counting their um, two other historic houses that they kind of, I guess, I don't know how you say it, Jessica, but kind of that you manage. Um, is it four, three? Three. Three other ones, okay, yeah, so yeah, I'm very wrong. But um, but I know one of those is a Dutch colonial dating to 1663, which is amazing. Um, also the farm, Decker Farm, right, with like a whole separate 11 other structures on 11 other acres. So I don't know how you do it all, it's pretty impressive. Um, I can see, but uh, yeah, it could, just the work must be overwhelming. Um, but just kind of a little bit of a primer on kind of the ecosystem of sites like Historic Richmond Town. As I mentioned, the, you know, all of these are really on parks land, so they're technically city owned, um, which means they're all of ours as New Yorkers. Um, they're public sites. Um, and then 19, at least from HHT's perspective, 19 of these 23 sites have their own separate nonprofits associated with them. So um, Historic Richmond Town, for example, is the Staten Island Historical Society, which was founded in 1856. Um, and technically still, you know, you still use that name, right, in many, yeah, in many ways. Um, and then Historic Richmond Town is also even more special because they're also one of New York City's 33 CIGs, so the Cultural Institution group um, of the Department of Cultural Affairs. So they receive some additional support um, from the city for various needs. So, you know, with New York City Parks Department and DCLA and HHT and the historic sites themselves, it's a very complicated um, ecosystem. And so even I get confused sometimes and we aren't here to iron it all out tonight. But um, I think what you should know is really just that um, even with all of these entities, uh, the nonprofits are really the ones who create the magic there on site. They really make these sites come alive through their programming and through their exhibitions um, and tons of other creative 
methods. And um, that's a big part of what my wonderful co-host tonight, Jessica Baldwin Phillips does um, as executive director and CEO of Historic Richmond Town. Um, and just to briefly introduce her, you were, so you were born and raised in the Hudson Valley, is that right? Okay, so that's a bit of, a, I was actually born in California, but it was okay. like this weird blip in the family history where my parents lived there for a little while, but then we moved back. They moved back, and um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a ninth generation New York Stater. Wow, okay. So not I born in that... New York, but I feel like you qualify. <laughs> um, and you've also worked for places that our audience has probably heard of, like the Intrepid and Francis Tavern um, before coming to Historic Richmond Town, I think was two years ago, is that right, Jessica? Just about, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and you're also currently leading um, I don't know what the exact title is, but the virtual programming subgroup of the Culture at Three initiative, which um, is a creation of a lot of cultural institutions from like the Met to kind of tiny one person um, museums that, um, you know, these people have all come together since the COVID crisis to really deal with a lot of the issues that have evolved. Um, so she has a real d deep interest in digital programming. Um, I think you were one of the first to get digital programs out there um, via your arts and culture and quarantine website. Um, so you're really uniquely situated to speak on all of this. Um, so I'll let you take it away. Um, feel free to give a little kind of like intro to these videos before we screen one and then I'll, I'll kind of intersperse with some questions here and there. Okay, thank you very much for that very generous <laughs> introduction. Um, <Of> course. <laughs> I am certainly not uh, the best person to talk about virtual programming. Like I was a like like to write my diary by candlelight. So I'm like digital what? But um, when COVID came uh, to the city and it was very clear that we were going to have to shut down, my team just started you know everybody remote work or whatever. But there was a deep desire to make sure that we continue to offer our mission relevant programming to our community. And it was a unique, oppor unique opportunity to, to broaden our audience as well. So since we started Arts and Culture in Quarantine, we've reached over 35,000 people, which is across the nation. And it's, a, it's an incredibly, an incredible number that we we're extremely proud of. And we did it through different types of uh, platforms. A lot of videos because they have a real as a video content. Um, we did a lot of tutorials. We did like those little coloring things that everybody's put out there, and um, we did some blogs. We did some pin. There's a lot, thousands of our pieces of our collection. We have a sixty thousand piece collection, and then we have forty carriages, and so uh, along with our, you know, and we have sixteen hundred linear feet of archives. So along with all the properties and the buildings and the acreage, we have uh, an institutional collection as well. And so the arts and culture in quarantine was just like a way to get it out there. But my staff has had never done digital programming before. So it was like, they like looked at me like, what are you talking about? Like, how are we going to do this? I have no idea. And I was like, all right, I will jump in with the sharks first. And then you can see that I'm going to be fine. And they were like, okay, good luck. So I was like, all right, I'm going to do like, well, people always like, what is in the basement of those houses? Like what's in the attics? You know, because the, all of our proper houses are not open to the public a lot of like ghost stories and like colloquial talk about the houses so let's just take it to the attics my friends and so in one day like it was in the middle of like shutting everything down I just like took my phone like real mom and pop like grassroots and like went to I think nine of the buildings and all in one day just shot these attic tours and like it tried to keep the same format I think some of it's wobbly and it's just like I'm not I'm a historian by trade so it and I've only been the role for a year and a half at that point. So I didn't have the deep history knowledge to talk about like who lived in the house and talk about the broader story. So it was really just like a quick and dirty, like, hey, this is kind of creepy. Let's leave now kind of tour. And we did do get to see the bell tower in the courthouse. I got to ring the bell from inside the bell tower, which was a really bad idea because it's extremely loud. And I look like a ding dong, like, like, oh God, it really hurts. I love that but, one. Um, <laughs> thank you. But it was fun. Um, I had a good time doing it. Awesome. So should we watch uh, the first one and then I can kind of give some, I know we have some questions, or I have some questions. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so Michelle, are you able to screen share and we can try that out? And um, hopefully everyone will be able to hear it. We tested it out earlier, so I think it should work. That wine looks nice, Jessica, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, 
Yes, I do hope that everyone has their cocktails as well. <laughs> well that's a nice, nice <laughs> still. Yeah, that's nice still. Part of that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jessica Baldwin Phillips, the Executive Director and CEO of Historic Richmond Town. And this is our Exploring the Attics of the Richmond Town property for our Arts and Culture and Quarantine series. So behind me is the Bohm House. And uh, this one's rarely ever open to the public. So let's go on inside and see what the attic has. This is the Bohm House. This is another Dutch door. So let's go on in. So this is rarely ever shown to folks. This is the Bohm House and it has an exhibition on the restoration of the house. It's a really cool exhibition. Um, we should open it back up. All right, so the attic has got to be upstairs. Okay. So you can see how they do plaster work. This is a really wonderful space. Let me explain the roof framing. Wow. So cool. Ooh. Door one or door two? Let's do both. Oh, look, there's a fireplace up here. This is move-in ready. Okay. Look at all the closet space. You know, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I'm walking around in creepy attics. That's what I'm doing. This one has a window in it, I wonder why. Oh, and some text. Syrups, picaspini, syrup of pine tar. I don't know about that, do you see that? This is a uh, encyclopedia of the United States. Some chairs up here, there's a fly. Sorry, bud, I hear you trapped in here. Okay, like, what is that? Okay, so that's a, it's a coffin. Cool, it's terrifying. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the video where I die. Out of that comes, and this one too. Oh, this one's tinier. A zombie, great. All right, well, uh, <laughs> that's so creepy. I'm not, I'm not lifting up the uh, blanket. Nope, not happening. I'm Jessica Baldwin Phillips, the executive director and CEO of Historic Richmond Town, and I am in the Bohm House in the attic. And we have seen some creepy stuff in this attic. There are not just one, but two coffins up here. So good times at the Bohm House at Historic Richmond Town. So if you, um, you know, want a creepy time, I guess uh, this is never open to the public. So you can't see this. So you get only to see it here. Uh, coffins at your service. This is Jessica Phillips at Historic Richmond Town for our Arts and Culture and Quarantine uh, series, and I'm exploring exploring the different attics. So I hope you enjoyed this one because I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go home now uh, before I die of a zombie. Okay, bye. It's so good. Michelle, we can see your uh, your history, some Taylor Swift on there. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Um, no, I, I love it. Like these videos, Jessica, are just so fantastic because I feel like you are just so personable and you kind of get the idea of what kind of art, like as a non-historian, like thoughts would be going through these spaces, which is really refreshing um, and is really great at kind of engaging people. Thank you. Um, yeah, but I feel like, first of all, like we need to talk about the coffins um, <laughs> and why they are there. I don't know if you, if anyone watches What We Do in the Shadows, which is like this great TV show about vampires in Staten Island. Um, if you don't, you should. It's, so, it's a comedy. 
if you can imagine. But yeah, <laughs> I know it's on it's on Hulu. It's called What We Do in the Shadows. Um, but yeah, it's it's so random. But anyway, it's just like I figured it must be like from that or something. But like, why are those coffins actually there? Do you even know? So when I got done with that tour, I like went outside and I was like, okay. <laughs> Dear curators, <laughs> what the hell? Yeah. I got like right on that. And so um, they're part of the, those are two coffins from the collection. There is nothing inside of them. Um, they're not like ex exhumed no. <laughs> people. Um, I can't remember exactly why we have them, uh, but the curator was like, take a deep breath. Everything is fine. And I was like, can you leave them not in the attic? Like, is there a more appropriate place for them to not be like in an attic where they're like extra creepy? Yeah. Um, so yes, they're, they're collection items. And um, apparently I'm not the first person to be like <laughs> terrified that they're like, what is going on yeah. here? Right. Well, because I know um, at Merchant's House, one of the other partner sites of Historic House Trust, they do a whole like Halloween kind of thing where they um, interpret it with like the death of one of the family members and the whole house is really done up in this whole kind of death motif. Um, I don't know, I find it really interesting because I think uh, maybe Historic Kitchen Town did that at some point at one of the house sites, but um, these idea, like this idea of ghost tours, the supernatural at historic sites and cities for that matter too, if you've ever been to New Orleans or, you know, Charleston, anything like that. I mean, they're huge money makers, really. Um, and I feel like some sites really embrace it as an engagement tactic, while others are kind of careful to avoid it. So I kind of wondered what your thoughts are on it, um, if you're kind of a <laughs> the yay or the nay category. Or <laughs> well, I used to be like, a, oh, that's so disrespectful to the, the pristine history of this site. But now I'm just like, you know what, we, we do, um, like, I think they're called paranormal investigation tours and like you know yeah. it's always funny because they always do it at night and my question is like why do you always come at night and they're like well the ghosts and i'm like what ghosts are like oh it's midnight let's party <laughs> like, okay but um so we you know i think that if people are willing to engage with history in a format that they are comfortable with or that interests them like then that's great you know like it's like the same kind of thing where kids learn differently and you can't say that there's one way to learn so I think it's really cool if you want to think that this place is haunted and stuff like then and we can throw in some real facts in there and then that's awesome. I do not think that these coffins are on that we do, on our paranormal tours. Um, at my at Francis Tavern, <laughs> maybe they will be now. That's right. Um, I don't at Francis Tavern there was a um, a paranormal investigator that came and like did these recordings and like he was like, "Can you hear the ghosts?" And I'm like, "No, I cannot." But um, people there was a, a terrorist bombing in the seventies at Francis Tavern and several people lost their lives. Really? And so, yeah. So one of the things that I told the investigator is that like, whatever you discover must end at 1900. Like, I don't want anybody who's living today to have any personal connections to anybody who may have lost their life mm -hmm. in the building, because I just think that that crosses a line of like, maybe I need to communicate with the dead. And like, I just, so keep me in the past is. Totally. Important. I can totally <laughs> understand that. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, I mean, having grown up in a haunted house, I totally think it. <laughs> I can tell you that story later <laughs> over more cocktails, but um, I mean, I don't really believe in it, but I definitely loved the whole idea around it. Um, so besides coffins, what is the kind of other strangest thing that you found just either on these attic tours or just in your two years at Historic Kitchen Town? Because I'm sure you come across some, some very odd things. Well, I feel like the staff doesn't really like it when I wander around and when I, <laughs> when I, cause we have just so much space, you know, we've just kind of, it's like, you know, when you move into a, a new, a bigger apartment or something, you're like, whoa, look at all the space. And in five years, you're like, wow, I need a bigger place. So like, you know, we've been there for so long that we've just like moved into all the spaces. So when I started walking around and when I started the job, I was eight and a half months pregnant. So like you imagine like a very pregnant person, like wandering through the basements. Yes. I opened, like I went through all, we have a, a an old school PS 28. And it's it still got the public school handles and the little kids' bathrooms. And it's like this really cool space. And there's a basement. So I was like wandering around the basement. I go through like four different doors. And it's like the lights aren't working. And I'm like, what is in here? And like I have a flashlight. And there are tombstones. Just like stacked next to each other. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah. it gets worse. I'm like looking down like this creepy hallway. And I see these like cubbies. They look like cubbies. They are cubbies. They're cubbies from the Cold War when they had gas masks for children. And I was like, whoa, I've gone in a wrong turn. 
um, let's go, baby. Let's That's get out of here. Funny. Yeah. Uh, so you yeah, have one. I feel like you like might need one these days. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's pretty horrifying. Um, okay, so moving away from kind of like the the supernatural, um, just kind of the larger, I don't know, like the theme of all of these, which you kind of mentioned to begin with, um, of discovering the idea of like landing on the idea of attic tours, um, but also just like the brief nature of these, I feel like are so perfect because of our really limited attention spans, like now, I think even more than um, before the COVID crisis. But um, I guess, you know, what, can you tell us like a little bit about just more about how that all formulated and um, you don't have to go into in depth, but like a little bit more around the structure of these and how you decided um, to kind of put these together. Sure, definitely. There's no depth to it. So it's really easy. I am a historian, but I also, and I love museums and stuff, but like, I hate reading labels. I hate taking guided tours. Like they bore me. I just want to go explore on my own. And so for me, I like that really brief snapshot of like getting to see something. So it's just like, I, people want to see something. And I did not have the information to tell them that hour long tour of it. And it's just like, it was a very quick and easy thing to do and a very accessible. And you can't get up to those spaces anyway. So it allows people for free now to see all of these different spaces they could never have seen before and still cannot see. So it was just like, kind of happened very organically. There was no like committees that like drafted out this plan. Right, right. Well, and I love that idea of accessibility as well. Because I know we have um, a larger project that we're trying to figure out how to make more of the historic sites accessible. Um, and just so many of the spaces just by nature, like the attics are never going to be able to be accessible. So it's like, how do you come up with ideas like this that you can um, kind of bring people up there in some way or another? Um, all right, so Michelle, do you wanna um, line up the second video? Um, which, oh. I, <laughs> which I love because we're, we're, we're about to do like a painting project on that one. Uh, so Jessica's doing like they're repainting the entire house sometime soon, the summer. The exterior, the exterior. Because yes. when you see the interior, you're like, oh, that's a big project. <laughs> this is, yeah, this one's in the middle of our property and it's like just this very focal building, but like we don't use it for anything. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Jessica Walden, Executive Director and CEO of Historic Richmond Town. We are here to explore the attics of some of Historic Richmond Town's buildings for our Arts and Culture and Quarantine series. So I am at the back of the Edwards Barton House, and we're gonna go inside and see what's in this attic. All right, so this is the back, back porch. I'm gonna get out my very cool key. This is not the North Pole, but uh, but that is the basement. All right, so we're gonna try and find the attic of this house. All right, so I'll we'll see you up there. Wow, it's very cool in here. All right, well, you know what? Instead of editing this, let's just go. Let's just see what's up there. the attic of the Edwards Barton house at Historic Richmond Down. I wonder if I will be greeted by a, uh, a raccoon or something. Ooh, okay, I do a flashlight. Ooh. Some sleds. Okay. What else is in here? Can you guys see this stuff? Chimney. Some rafters, okay. Let's see what else is up here. Oh, it's quite a spacious attic. Not creepy at all. Some barrister bookshelves. Noted. Some frames. What a pretty view. All right, that's Historic Richmond down out there. Now these windows were recently restored, reglazed, sealed up. It's a very nice view. Snake Hill, still busy. 
What else we got? Ooh, some trunks, some lamps, and a lot of dust. All right, a lot of lighting, some baby carriages. Ah, this is ready, ready for use. Just dust it off a little. Okay. All right, this is the Edward Spartan house. We are in the attic exploring the attics of historic Richmond town. There you go. So I'm Jessica Baldwin Phillips, the executive director and CEO of historic Richmond town. And we are in the attic of the Edward Spartan house. Not much up here really, just a bunch of lighting fixtures, some old uh, flexible flyers. A lot of dust, but uh, this is another attic uh, of Historic Richmond Town for our Arts and Culture and Quarantine series. So uh, I hope you'll join me in exploring some of our other attics and we'll find some cool stuff. All right, bye. Is it? <laughs> is it? I can watch these. Every <laughs> it's like everything that like you're not supposed to be a narcissist you're not supposed to like critique yourself it's like very weird um yeah i'm also I like oh dear I, maybe you shouldn't have been so down and dirty and grassroots with that get a no, crew. I love it. um i would not have i would not be able to watch these if they were of me like i absolutely hate all of that stuff but yeah i feel like your hair looked really good that day that's so you should be, like feel <laughs> be proud um but anyway, but I, so I've already mentioned this, but I like love, love, love the DIY nature of all of these. Um, and I feel like it's an important question because I know, you know, when a lot of these smaller institutions were really, and you mentioned this before, like they kind of all of a sudden needed to produce this type of content when doors were shut, like within like a week. And, you know, the idea was really that people were struggling with this because they were comparing themselves to like the Met and like institutions that just have so many more resources to produce this. Um, so can you just like speak on this a bit and how you felt like people like I feel like I respond really well to this kind of DIY like and I know you we've talked about it before that you were just like you just need to like create these like push it out like whatever it takes because honestly like you got these out there in the world which is like nice and you know at least there's something and people can engage with this so. Yeah, people, I think, just like we were talking about, like, how you wouldn't want to watch yourself, I think people are very concerned with how people are going to accept them. And I think it's really important to remember that people are rather generous. Like, unless you're a TikTok star, you're not getting trolls. You know, like, no, I mean, I got, like, a few comments, but, like, I'm like, yeah, okay. But, like, I think it's really important to just, people are very appreciative of, they, like, they understand that this is not, you're not, a, I'm not an actress, like, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, and I think that that kind of, welcoming and like understanding was was received and i felt very encouraged and i think that people need to remember that like that people are generally good and they're just so happy to you know like what kind of troll is like stumbling upon this like this is for people who are like like seeking this kind of like history based stuff um so you know and i think that it's tech can be very scary to people of any generation and you know i think that it's important to be that tech, like that digital literacy is super important for employment in any field right now. And I think that, it, you know, if you weren't already okay with it, this has been a wonderful time to develop those kinds of skills. And so that I really worked with my staff to do a lot of digital literacy, like videos and whatever, like you're home working from home. And like a lot of my interpreters, they are interpreting. So taking those videos and taking those courses and the webinars and stuff was really cool for them and be able to like be more comfortable in front of the camera and stuff. Yeah. And what was the frequency? Like, did you have a plan? Probably not, but like, did you have a plan in place? <laughs> like, if you're anything like us, we're like, yeah, totally. We had a plan and it was on paper. <laughs> no, but if it, like, did you, I mean, because now you have a lot of great content up there, but like, was it just kind of jumping on it and trying? Okay. Yeah, it was like real, it was real rough. Like it, I just did all nine houses in one day with the full yeah. intention of going back. No, I have not. <laughs> and I um, may, may not have come up. <laughs> I'm sure some will be asking me to do that again. Um, but yeah, and then it's like, okay, so, you know, I, we did like this staff library. So I like did this one, I picked some history texts from my library and I was like, you know, the ones that were signed or whatever, and just like kind of went through them, like the attic videos. It was not an academic review of books. Right. And some of the other staff, like people in administrative roles were like, oh, I told, like, I love history. That's why I work here. And I have some history texts. And so they did a staff library review as well. So it was, 
like kind of these things that we a hit and miss. And like, and I told the staff, like, if you do something and it fails miserably, that's okay. Like we just want to do another one. Like it's not that big of a deal. I think that permission to fail is really important to give people and like, let them know that this is, it's not on paper. <laughs> so just, you know, do what you, and like, you know, and now it's months later. And so we have like much more things developed and we know that videos hit more, like that's just something. So the more video content you can push out, the better. Right. Interesting. And then and maybe, oh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. maybe you're know. you're lucky enough to like get a troll who's gonna start like a massive comment war and it's like gonna blow it up and like you know any good press, right. bad press, yeah. whatever. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, yeah, you could be the new like viral star. It'd be amazing. Um, and then uh, so just before we move on to the next video, I mean, are there any other things? I know the all of the things you're digging into with the subcommittee of the culture at the three group um, kind of unearthed some interesting things. But is there like one or two? I mean, I think it's what we've already been talking about is like permission to fail, like DIY is okay, like all that kind of stuff. I know you've been looking into platforms, not that we want to go into that much specifics, but. <laughs> yeah, I think that the, the so the Culture 3 has over 200 of New York City's culturals that participate in it. It was originally started by the CIG group, which is like this privileged group of 33 culturals that receive operational funding from the city. So it's a very fortunate place. It's a, it's a, an embarrassment of riches. And so after a couple of days of us, just like the 33 of us just getting together and having a chat about what the heck we're going to do in COVID, we were like, hey, maybe we should open this up to like everybody. Like maybe, because like the Met is on this call. So like they have these massive, they have lobbyists on staff. So like we, you know, so to open that up to any New York City arts and culture institution was so cool because we got this broad group of folks from, you know, performing arts and, you know, all, everywhere. And then we got these working groups because we couldn't discuss it all in an hour every day. So the online programming working group I, I chair and there's over, you know, 80 people, but regularly like, like 20 people participate every week. Okay. Not and uh, we, <laughs> to be honest, yeah. <laughs> and um, so we talk about platforms, like people, like the small mom and pops that have like two staff or it's a husband and wife or a wife and a wife and whatever it is, it's just a small right. people. They don't know what the major, you know, platforms to use. And so we're like, all right, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. That's all you need to do. You can't do that many, just do Facebook. You know, yeah. post once a day. If you have videos, put those out. Like, so it was kind of just like a how-to tutorial. And we also hosted yeah. free webinars from communication specialists to anybody to participate and ask questions. That's awesome. Yeah, and I know um, their work has been featured in the New York Times now, the Culture at Three group. Um, it's become like a big, big thing. And they've really, I mean, there was a, um, a, a hearing for the Department of Cultural Affairs earlier this week, which like they were constantly mentioning this group. So they've really gotten, put all these people together and their voices caused a lot of good change for the city, which is fantastic. Yeah. Well, there, and that because you're, if you're a CIG and you receive this operational funding, right, to preserve history or to promote the arts, what are you doing for the broader community? Okay, great. There's 33 of you. Like, what are you doing for everybody else? All the other little historic districts, everybody who could, who's part of this, like the, the lifeblood of New York City, the arts and culture scene. And so this culture at three call, this daily call, there's like over 70 of them now, like how that's part of how that city funding has helped um, support the wider arts and culture community. I and mean, it's been this like, this like wonderful thing for us all to participate in and to serve the, the everybody, agreed. keep culture alive. Yeah, agreed. Well, thank you for taking on that digital programming subgroup because I know that's a lot of what people are struggling with over the past three months. Um, all right, Michelle, did you want to show the last video? And then I think we'll open it up. I have a couple other questions, but we can open it up to the audience after that. Hi, I'm Jessica Baldwin Phillips, Executive Director and CEO of Historic Richmond Town. And I'm here in front of the Vorlaser House. So this is a pretty famous house here on our property. And uh, I've never been upstairs. I've never been in the attic. So come on, let's go see what's up there. Okay, one of these Dutch doors. Okay, that wasn't so hard. Right. Obviously, class is not in session. Yeah, let's go up to the attic. Let's see what we got. Hmm. Creepy that your teacher might sleep where they teach. We frown upon that now. Okay. 
Oh dear. Okay. Maybe the attic must be up here. in the middle of the room. Just really creepy. Okay. All right, so there's some architectural components up here. Chimney. Let's look at those rafters. Look at those rafters, folks. Real beauties. That lonely little light is coming from this window. Help, I'm stuck in the attic with a crazy lady. So I'm inside the Vor Lasers house at Historic Richmond Town. I'm the executive director and CEO, Jessica Bolden Phillips. And uh, this is our arts and culture and quarantine series. And we're here exploring the attics of our uh, Historic Richmond Town property. So I hope you enjoyed this attic and uh, we'll come and join us um, as we explore some more. All right, bye. Sorry, I think I think some of you weren't able to see that. That's the the video started out black for me, but then it came through. So, um, so but you'll have to go onto the Historic Richmond Town website and <laughs> watch the video yourself. Because wait, you said you have over nine now, nine or ten videos. I think there are ten total. Um, so sorry for if you didn't see it, but it, I think you probably heard the amazing keys at the beginning of this one and the last one, which I feel like we need to chat about briefly because they're incredible like who keeps these like what's the story of all these keys but it can't be you right <laughs> somebody else so the, like the story of the keys is hilarious is when i first got the job they're like here's the key to your office here's the key to the building of your office and i was like great and like i went to walk around the houses and i was like where are the keys to all of these houses and they were like there aren't enough for you to have a set and i was like excuse me I, i'm the hello i'm jessica i'm the ceo can i please have access to the spaces so apparently there was a lot of these keys made, that there was like 90 of them made. And these are these, there's a mold, there's a brass mold, they're, they're solid brass keys. And when Richmond Town Restoration, which was like the original name of the team, they made all the locks the same to these like, they're big, they're like this big, they're huge, these big brass keys. But over the years, as employees leave, they take them with them because they're beautiful and they're so cool or they get lost or whatever. Yeah. And so I like, I was like, fine, you're not going to give me a set. I'll make my own. So like I found the mold and security office and like called a jeweler and I was like, how much to make me these keys? And he was like, $5,000. And I was like, have a nice day. <laughs> yeah, seriously. No, we used to give these keys, like, or we did a key like this for our honorees at our gala every year. And they, they would like piece it together from different antique keys to make like a bigger one. But it was expensive. Like it was so pricey. Yes, they're not cheap. Um, but I did get a board member who reluctantly, like, accidentally revealed that he had a set. And I was like, no, 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 hand them over, Bob. Hand them over, Bob. So, like, now I have my own set. <laughs> I didn't realize I would have like, made you bring, like, the key ring with all the keys. They're incredible. They're cool. um, that's interesting. So, anyway, so I know this, so this was the last video that you posted, right? Like, I think you, po you posted this recently, like within the last week or so, I believe. So. Yes, and it was the last video that I did, which is why it's just like, okay, thanks so much, bye. It was so yeah, yeah, like, all right, done. Um, but I guess the question is like, how do you see this? Because the world is slowly reopening, or at least New York, and then, you know, other states or other stories, of course. But um, like, how do you see this content kind of living on, I guess, like an all virtual content, just to make it more broad, like, and how do you see this becoming part of your just larger engagement plan um, for the future? We're definitely going to keep doing virtual programming. It's not going to uh, stop when we go back to direct services. Um, I definitely want to finish the attic tours and I want to do all the attics of all four properties. Um, it should get started soon because it's probably really hot up there now. Uh -huh. um, but uh, yeah, I think it's really important that it's like, you've broken the seal. Like we're in the virtual world now, HRT, Historic Richmond Town, and, and it's important to keep the momentum with that. And I think we we aren't going to be giving our direct services like we used to, not for a while. So there will be the capacity to continue online programming. Like our summer camp is virtual and I think it's cool. Like you, and we're gonna add captions to things. So for accessibility, and I think that it's the, 
it's the way it's just the way you got to be you can't just you know do direct services you're not going to reach as many people and it's just like why would you if you can reach more people with your mission why wouldn't you right exactly and i love that you said that you really have reached people nationwide through this when normally they wouldn't be able to come see the site but um no it's incredible and i think it's i think the hard part is also just figuring out what the balance is because you know as people return to the site and i know you I think just this week, I think you finished your reopening plan and you're kind of looking towards the future um, of that, which is really exciting, but it's also kind of nerve wracking. And it's like, how do you, and one part of that is obviously programming, but like, how, like, will there be a combination type of programming where you can like have people on site, but also have a virtual component that works together? It's, it's complicated, but um, yeah, I don't know how you would even address all of that. Maybe my next addict tours could be live. Like live Ooh, streaming. Yeah, that would be fun. Yeah, live tours would be really, really fun. Um, and I know, actually, I think it, uh, HTC has done a few of those recently. I, I think they did a, a tour of Guanis, Michelle. I think that was last week. Um, we, we've done supposedly it, was, really it was. It was partial. It, um, um, it was about that's fun. minutes on the street, and then we went to virtual. Nice. Yeah, I did a tour. I did an in-person tour years ago of Greenpoint, and it was really fun. We did, like, it was a really nice time. But I'm not promising anything, Michelle. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so I, did, I guess that's kind of all with the videos and the questions. I know, um, I mean, I, I just really want to urge people to view all of the other content that Jessica has created and her team um, on the Arts and Culture and Quarantine website. And maybe I can put that in the chat now if people um, want that. But it re really has some fun things. Like it has like 19th century hair tutorials, which I love. And I feel like I kind of need right now with three months of no haircut. I'm like, <laughs> I need some attention. Um, but also cooking stuff. And um, I know I want to. Oh, sorry, I'll mute. <laughs> um, I want to open it up to questions from the audience. And Michelle, I'm not sure how you want to um, do that. But um, I know one of my kind of final questions, um, just to start us off, is I know you have kind of a, a subsection on the website for diversity, equity, inclusion, and you have a couple of great videos about that. Um, so I know just via virtual programming, like how are you addressing that? Um, at Historic Richmond Town to tell these more inclusive narratives and also, um, you know, beyond that too, if you want to touch on some of that stuff. Sure, we're not doing enough, I'll tell you that. Um, so we do have a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan and we are working the plan. It's a six-year plan, but as anybody who's been um, in this work realizes it's a never-ending plan, um, never-ending work. And I think that, you know, Historic Richmond Town is this really cool historic area and with all these buildings and a lot of them are original to the site and the story the narrative is like the white colonial narrative that's been always told and the neat thing about historic richmond town is that in the 50s there was like we're about the common man the everyday man and like back then that was like super progressive but now it's like no 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 so i'm trying to and i i've uh, there's only there's a seven departments that um, work there and there's only one person who's original to when I started a, a year and a half ago. So I've been really trying to change the institutional culture to make sure that um, low battery, huh? Make, so make sure that everybody who works in historic Richmond town understands that it, I want the holistic narrative told and that is um, where the world is going, that you just, you know, I'd rather be on the right side of history than the wrong side. It's just one choice. And that it's not, and for me, people are like, okay, great, let's talk about the enslaved populations and the houses. And I was like, yeah, okay, but you look at yourself in a story and you don't want to just see the oppression. You want to see the, the wonderful contributions that people who are like you have made to the world and to society, and those stories are there. So it's not like I, I encourage my staff, but it's not just like, okay, slavery, civil war, civil rights, Barack Obama. Like, that's not the, the, the Black history I wish to tell. I think that that is the component of it, certainly. And it's not that I am going to be telling these stories. I want our, our interpreters to be a diverse group to tell these histories. And, um, you know, I love the reenactors that there's, like, women in the battlefields. Like, I think, the, and as dressed as, a, you know, private, not as, like, a, a camp encampment supporter. Right. Um, so I think that it's, it's super important and I look forward to continuing to grow our programming so that we are telling that broad narrative. Yeah, and I know so many of the other Historic House Trust sites are doing such incredible things and that and just really, because it's hard because so many of the stories don't have 
research done yet. They're just kind of under told, they're under researched, all of that kind of thing. Like there's just not documentary evidence to, to tell it. So it's like, how do you, which kind of means you can be more creative in a, in a sense or. I yeah, know. I think a lot of historians or a lot of curators definitely have their, their, their go-to answer historically has been like, well, they're just primary source to back up this narrative. And like, as a historian, like that is a public historian, that, that is what you are told. Like you cannot tell, interpret a narrative until you have primary source documentation. Well, the primary source documentation for the uh, people who have been marginalized, you know, they don't have, all they have is like their ownership records of who owns them or who had, whose house they were married into. And, you know, like, that's not that great. We, okay, we, we know the oppressive story. So it's important to really kind of be creative as how we use our primary source documentation to tell these narratives. Maps can tell um, a lot about uh, how gerrymandering has changed things. Like, it, so you have to be creative in how you use your primary sources. Yeah. And I also, I love that you, like the videos that you put up on um, your website or like, I think through your intern or through a fellow or something like that, it's just like a young person. It's just so refreshing. It's like, it's not just like this scholar talking about this time. Like you give somebody like the freedom to just like tell their story on there, which is so nice. Um, anyway, Michelle, did you want to, how do you want to do questions? Um, I want to just make sure everyone has a chance to ask Jessica <laughs> while she is with us. But uh, if anyone has questions, please put it in the chat or the Q&A section. So far, okay. right now, we have a confused video, which I'm very sorry about. Um, but again, you can go to their website to watch the videos, or all of this is being recorded, and you can watch all of this back um, and watch it on our YouTube video or uh, YouTube channel. What is the range of dates of construction of the houses? So our earliest house is colonial period and that's the Perrine house and it is not on the main property. It's the oldest house in Staten Island and the third oldest house in the state. Um, then we go up until 1904, I believe is the oldest house on the main property. So late Victorian. And that's the Edwards Barton house, the one that we had the little tour of with the, the barrister bookshelves. Right. Isn't there like an Italian American story attached to that house or is that? Yes. So just like my name is Baldwin Phillips, like how waspy <laughs> can you be? Super waspy. The um, Edwards Barton house is a very like, you know, uh, white colonial narrative name, but the Aquilino family is actually the longest tenant or uh, resident of that house. And they started in Staten Island's first pizzeria right next door. Love it. <laughs> And so the we are actually wasn't in the house. It was like next door, right? It was like they lived. Okay. Yeah. They lived in the house, had the pizzeria next door and a Richmond town restoration. When they acquired the house and the property, they demoed the pizzeria because it wasn't like, you know, old timey or whatever, which is so sad because now we'd love yeah. to be able to tell that story. So we are actually talking about renaming the house, the Edwards Barton Aquilino house. I love that. You should. Yeah. Pizza oven, I'm sure. Pardon? Oh. Building a pizza oven. Obviously. Yeah. Oh, well, and then you come to Staten Island, you want pizza. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have had some of my best pizza in Staten Island, and I have to say. Um, yeah. I feel like if you like just make up a story that you invented pizza at Historic Kitchen Town, then it'll be fine, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the rest of Staten Island would be pretty angry. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true, yeah. Smart, smart. Um, but yeah, the um, I think one of my other questions was just like what your I know you're you're not supposed to pick favorites, but kind of what your favorite structure because I know there's not just houses. There's I mean there's like a bridge. There's all kinds of really cool yes. things. So I don't know. The if bridge is favorite. beautiful. Yeah. So Staten Island, the historic Richmond Town actually has the only mating beaver family in New York City. And this little beaver family, you're like, why are you talking about this? Because I love nature. So the beavers actually, like, it's so beautiful because we have Richmond Creek that runs through the property. And there is this arched rubble stone um, bridge. It's gorgeous. It's original. And the beavers, like, go in and out. And it's just a wonderful thing. Um, I love the bridge, yes. But I love the Christopher House. So it's a um, 18th century reproduction, I believe. Um, it was, uh, or it was, like, 100% restored. Um, in the last three decades. But it's so beautiful because it's right on the edge of the marshland, which goes out into New York Harbor. So it's just like, you can look at the one angle of the house and just like forget that you're in a metropolis of like 8 million people. It's like this mind blowing thing. 
Yeah. Well, and that's what's so nice about that site and kind of going back to the idea, but like it really does feel like a village that you're in and there's like this great, I don't know, I, the first time I went was years and years ago. We went to like one of the festivals that you had. Um, this is like way before my time at HHT, but it was just so fun. We got like the Italian sausage and the ice cream and just had fun there and it just felt really alive, which, I, I, which is nice. I think, I guess that was before your time too, but I think it's, yeah. you know, it's just really, I don't know, you do such a good job there really bringing that site to life, which is, which is all we want to do, right? <laughs> yeah, and I love that the, you know, like the printing press works and we use it and, you know, it's a lot of that uh, multi-sensory history immersive experience that we don't do first person interpreting. So it's really cool. And I think that there's also a really important story that we don't tell is about the Lenape that occupied that land before the colonizers took it. Yeah, that's true. And I know a lot of sites are kind of thinking about that too, like how you might interpret that in the landscaping. And, and I don't know, like it's, it's a tough question because it's like if there's not material evidence and I think it's, it goes to actually one of the questions, Norman Weiss. Hi, Norman. <laughs> um, well, first of all, he mentioned that there's a substantial 19th century history of Italians on Staten Island. I feel like- Yes. If you can find the title, oh, do you know it, Jessica? No, but I know that there is a substantial history of 19th century Italians oh. on Staten Island. Okay, I read that as like, like there's like a book on like Italians. Oh, there, and there probably is, and I, I bet there is. Um, but anyway, but his question is, the, are there decorative arts collections in any of the houses? Yes, there are. Not necessarily in the exhibition space. Uh, when I moved in, moved in to my office, there is decorative arts in this, the administrative spaces, um, which I would never have done. I don't like keeping collections in office spaces, but uh, yeah, we have a, a nice painting collection, fine, fine art, um, things like that. But it, most of it's um, material culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you, put, you said that you had, what was the number, 60,000? 60, 60,000, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, like, just to let you know, we have 600 hand planes in the collection, which is like how you like shave the wood, you know? So, um, that's you know. incredible. Yeah. I mean, that's like, it's such an important thing to have. And I, you have a video on that too, on the website, which is yes. great. So I feel like you got all these different people to really give some different, um, content to the, the website, which is great. Um, anyway, I think that's it. I mean, I know we're hitting up against six o'clock. Um, Michelle, did you, am I, are there other questions that I didn't see? Joe's feeling that says, how many houses are original? and how many were moved there? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know that number off the top of my head. So you guys are gonna think I'm like, what a terrible historian. Like if you ask me anything about Francis Tavern, I can tell you like the deep history of that because I was there for seven years. So I'm still learning all the facts. Um, I believe, uh, would, like I would like to say like 28% of them are, have been moved onto the property. Maybe 33%. And how many of them, like, how many of them are, have been reconstructed? Most of them. Most. So there was, it was like a colonial Williamsburg style restoration where they peeled it all back down and reconstructed them to the way they thought they would look back in a certain time period, which is old timey, as far as I can tell, um, which is like hilarious time period, old timey. Um, you know, like the tavern, our guy in tavern. Term, that's like an old timey. It's a old technical term. Technical. Yeah. Not in my world, Matthew. <laughs> So like the tavern was like this like fake stone front bodega when they acquired it. And now it's like this 18th century urban tavern, or I guess it's rural, but it, anyway. Um, but that's not what it looked like when they got the building. So they like stripped it down. They brought in old growth pine to like reconstruct it. And um, so it's a lot of reconstruction. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions, Michelle? I believe that is it. Any last thoughts, Jessica? Do you have any, like, I mean, what would you tell people? I mean, I know you have no idea when is going to reopen. Um, and obviously you have great virtual content until it does, but what, like, what would you tell people kind of coming to H or HRT for the first time? Um, you know, there, I'm sorry. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, you know, it, you can't, we lack signage so like the self-guiding tours are really hard to do because it isn't like identifying the houses very easily and it's not that um user-friendly but you know what 
don't come yet. Come in three years, okay? In three years, it's going to be this really cool place. Um, so that's what I had to say about that. <laughs> An interesting don't visit. Or, interesting visitation model. <laughs> Um, well, thank you, Jessica, for joining us. You're a delight as always. Um, and thank you, Michelle, for all of this. Um, but yeah. Thank, thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. This was uh, great. I've actually still not been to historic Richmond town, even though I've wanted to go several times. So your videos have been great. I've learned a lot and they're very entertaining. Thank you. <laughs> I, know, I feel like we should have shown like pictures of historic Town at some point, but it's just giving you a taste so everyone wants to go visit, right? <laughs> like, Hopefully. Yeah. In three years. <laughs> All right. Well, thank, thanks everyone for joining. Thank you. Uh, again, HDC also has a lot of digital content. You can check out our website, hdc.org, or also our YouTube channel, where we have both uh, in-person walking tours that we did before COVID and virtual walking tours that we've done after, and also all of our preservation schools, both in-person and virtual, are all, all available as well. So go forth and enjoy. We will see everyone in person eventually. Someday, someday. someday. <laughs> All right, bye everyone. Thank you. Oh. There's the baby. <laughs> bye. Oh, so cute. Bye. 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 Oh, you're precious. <laughs>